We are in the second last message of this book of Daniel, this fascinating, fascinating book. And if you haven't been with us for most of this book, you just need to know that the book of Daniel is divided in half by theme. And the first six chapters, the first half, are a historical autobiography of our main man, Daniel. It's the story of his life as a captive in Babylon around 450 to 500 BC, around that sort of span of time. And each chapter deals with one significant event like Daniel's famous time in the lion's den. The second half of the book of Daniel is incredibly mystical in that it is made up of dreams and visions that Daniel receives from God in which God delivers to Daniel prophecies, predictions about the future that are going to unfold and take place. And the incredible thing is, many of those things have already unfolded exactly as God said they would, but there are also things that the Lord told Daniel that are yet to come. They're future tense even for us, and that's what makes this so, so interesting. Last week, we studied through chapter 10, in which we found Daniel in a state of mourning. He was praying for his people, his nation, Israel. And then he encountered an angel sent from heaven who brought him a message in response to his prayers. And as that angel told Daniel about the difficulties he encountered in reaching Daniel, we received some incredible insights into how prayer affects and works in the spiritual realm, the unseen world that is around us that affects everything. This week, that same angel will continue to speak to Daniel. So in the last chapter, chapter 10, we saw Daniel mourning over the fact that after 70 years in exile in Babylon, when they were finally set free, less than 50,000 of them actually returned to Israel and started rebuilding the country and the city of Jerusalem. Daniel was devastated. He had assumed everyone shared his passion for God's country and God's city. In chapters 11 and 12, the angel is going to explain to Daniel the reason why that was the case. So he's going to answer Daniel's question of why aren't my people responding to this great miracle that you've done? The 70 years the Jews spent in exile in Babylon were part of God's discipline on the nation. It was corrective discipline to turn their hearts back to the Lord. But the reality is that's not how things played out. And so the process of God bringing discipline on the nation of Israel had to continue. And it would continue all the way until the Messiah, Jesus, arrived on the earth. And so this angel shares with Daniel what is going to unfold in world history between that time, the time Daniel is alive, and the time when Messiah will arrive on the earth over 400 years later, and how during that time period in between, Israel is going to be trampled and oppressed as part of God's chastening, his discipline of the nation of Israel. These events are going to be stunningly precise and verifiable if you just go read secular world history. Any history book will affirm everything that Daniel prophesies here. These events will unfold, though, after Daniel's death, which begs the question, why reveal these things to Daniel if they're only going to happen after Daniel has died? Why would God do that? Well, the answer is found in what we're doing right now, studying through the book of Daniel. Even though Daniel had no idea that you and I would be here today doing this around 2,500 years later, the Lord compelled and urged Daniel to write this record and to record all of the prophecies he received from the Lord. And if you've been with us through this study, then you know the book of Daniel has a lot to say about things that are still in the future that haven't happened yet. So what would be the best way for the Lord to get us to take those things that are yet to happen seriously? What would be the best way for him to get us to take those things seriously? I suggest to you it would be for the Lord to prophesy world events that would be future events to Daniel, but past history to us. So in other words, if God could prove to us, if he could show us that he could predict the future with stunning accuracy, it should cause us to say we need to take seriously the things God says about the future that haven't happened yet. 
And wouldn't you know it, that is exactly what the Lord has done in the book of Daniel. Again, if you've been with us as we've studied this book, then you've already studied many examples of God predicting world history that have come to pass exactly as he said they would. Today, the degree of specificity really is going to get downright ridiculous. It's going to be a fascinating walkthrough of some parts of world history, but I need to be honest, there's really not going to be a lot here that you can take and apply to your life. I'm not going to pretend there is. I'm not going to be one of those guys who's going to say, there was a king in a castle, and maybe some of you, like a castle, have walls up in your life. I'm not going to do anything like that, okay? I'm not going to stretch this to try and apply it where there's no application. I want to be really, really honest about that. And so for some of you today, you might geek out on this like I do and go, wow, this is amazing. You might chew on this and go, you know, that's tasty. That's a little spicy. I like that. Some of you might chew on this and say, you know, that's a little bit dry. But we need to remember throughout our study that all of this proves that God is able and faithful to keep his word. Everything that he says he will do for us, he has the power to do it, and he is faithful enough to do it as well. He's able and faithful. He's proven through prophecy that his word is true. And so that's what you need to be encouraged by as we're going through this. So some of what we're going to talk about today, we've already studied in great detail in earlier chapters of Daniel. I'm not going to rehash all that stuff again. If you missed out on any of that, I encourage you to go to the website, listen to those messages, and catch up. I'm also going to tell you this is probably the most difficult message I've ever put together in my life. I couldn't even come out, come up with an outline. Um, so just really make notes as things stick out to you. There's a couple of fill-ins right at the beginning, and then there's just a lot of space for you to make your own na- notes. So to understand verse 1, we need to go back to the last verse of the previous chapter. Because as you may know, in the Bible, they only added chapters several hundred years after the Bible was written after the time of Christ. So chapter 10 just flows straight into chapter 11. There's no break in the original manuscripts. So the last verse of the previous chapter, chapter 10, says this. The angel speaking to Daniel says, But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Continuing into verse 1 of chapter 11. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. The him in verse 1 is Michael, the archangel. So earlier in chapter 10 when we studied last week, the angel had said, Daniel, I was held up by powerful demons in the area of Babylon, and Michael had to come and help me. That was in the third year of Darius, according to chapter 10. But two years before that, in the first year of Darius, the same angel is telling Daniel at that time, two years earlier, I actually had to come and help out Michael. So they worked together. Now, what had happened two years before this in the first year of Darius? Well, that was when Cyrus the Great had issued the decree that freed the Jews to return to Israel, go back to their homeland. And surely at that point, these same powerful satanic forces that opposed the angel when he tried to reach Daniel with the message, Surely those same satanic spiritual forces were working incredibly hard to try and keep the Jews in Babylon to stop that decree being passed and to stop the people from returning back to God's country. And so it was during that time that Michael and this angel are working together to get that decree passed and get as many of the Jews as they can back to Israel. Just a side note and just some interesting stuff. Verse 2, the angel keeps talking and he says, And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So please understand this. There are more than four kings between the time of Darius the Mede and the guy who we're going to find out is this fourth king. There are more than four kings between those two. What the angel is saying is that you'll know who that fourth king is 
because he's going to lead a major attack on Greece. At this time in world history, Greece is an absolute non-factor on the world political stage. They have the military might of Newfoundland, basically at this time. So this was a very distinctive mark that the angel was telling Daniel. He's saying, you're going to know who this fourth king is because he is going to launch into a war against Greece. And so this would have been a very clear identifying mark. Well, why does this angel start this prophecy three kings before this fourth king? I have no idea. I just want to let you know so that we all understand the point is not the three other kings. The point is the fourth king who's going to go to war with Greece. The third king would be a king called Darius I. Under Darius I, there was constant tension between the rising Greek empire and the Persian empires. One day they were friends, the next day they're fighting, and the Persians were always fighting to hold on to this territory known as Thrace. If you look at a map, you'll find that the region of Persia sort of meets Europe um, at this really thin point known in antiquity as the Hellespont. It's known today as the Dardanelles Strait. It's where instead of there being this huge Aegean Sea, it narrows to a very small strait. And so if ever, the, ever there were military campaigns, this is where the ships would cross because it was the shortest distance, the quickest way to move your army across the Aegean Sea. And so Thrace is just on the European side of the Hellespont, the Dardanelles Strait. And so the Persians were always fighting to hold on to some territory they had acquired on the European side of the strait. And in 490 BC, Darius I, the Persian, launches a battle to take things up a notch. And he ends up suffering a massive defeat in the Battle of Marathon. It's a battle that also takes a significant toll on the Greeks. Darius I's son would be the one that this angel identifies as the fourth king, the legendary figure in world history known as Xerxes. Xerxes was famous for his unbelievable wealth that he accumulated. He had so much money that he was able to spend four years equipping and training up an army of at least two million men. That's how much wealth he had. That figure would be a huge army today. At that time in world history, it was incomprehensible. It was mind-blowing. And so Xerxes who is out of his mind crazy, like every impressive military leader in world history, Xerxes starts thinking one day about how his dad attacked Greece and was defeated. And it begins to really bug Xerxes, because he's thinking, we're the Persian Empire. We should be the undisputed greatest people, kingdom, nation on earth. This, this, this is not okay that we have unresolved business with the Greeks. And so in 480 BC, Xerxes launches all-out war against the Greeks. And accounts of antiquity tell us that he actually created a chain of barges across the Hellespont more than two kilometers long and marched his army of two million men across these barges. It took them a full week to move his whole army from one side to the other, marching all day and all night. That's how big his army was. If you want to know how out of his mind crazy he was, a few months before that, he had a first attempt at creating these barges that failed. But the currents were so strong, they snapped the cables holding them all together. So he ordered the Hellespont, like the water, to be flogged and had hundreds of his men go in with whips and whip the waves in the Hellespont. He's out of his mind, crazy, really, really crazy guy. But he eventually gets across there on the second attempt. He wins the Battle of Thermopylae, defeating the legendary King Leonidas of Sparta. He captures and burns Athens, the most impressive Greek city of the time. He gains control of all of mainland Greece, north of Corinth. And instead of sending his troops where the majority of Greeks remaining soldiers were and finishing the job, he follows some bad advice and attacks the remaining ships in the Greek Navy under unfavorable conditions and he loses. It's now winter so the fighting season is over. He sets up camp in Thessaly in Greece. However, he becomes concerned that some of the remaining Greeks are going to cut away his barges on the Hellespont and strand him and his army in Europe. So he retreats back to Persia along with most of his army. He leaves behind a small military contingent to finish the job. 
However, that contingent is defeated by the Greeks within a year. And so this giant incursion that Xerxes made into Greece, conquering Greece, all comes to nothing within 12 months of him doing that. Suffice to say, though, after killing countless Greeks, after burning Athens to the ground, the Greeks hate the Persians after this all goes down, and they never forget it, which sets up verses 3 and 4, which are going to summarize the Greek empire. Verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Around 150 years later, a mighty Greek king would arise. That would be Alexander the Great. And he took all the national rage, the nationalism that the Greeks had towards the Persian Empire, and he crossed the Hellespont into Persia and began conquering territory with incredible speed. And by age 33, not only had he conquered the entire Persian Empire, he had conquered the entire world as far east as India. And when the Persians were the main power on the world block, they controlled Israel. When Alexander and the Greeks rose to power, they controlled Israel. And you're going to begin to see this pattern of Israel being caught in the middle of all these world empires coming and going. And they are getting trampled in the process over and over again across these centuries. That's what this is all about. Verse 4, and when he, Alexander the Great, has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, so not among his children, nor according to his dominion, his power with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. And if you've been with us through our study, you know this is referring to the way in which Alexander's empire was broken up after his death. So continue to remember here the specificity of this prophecy because this was written a couple of hundred years before this stuff actually happened. There's a legend from history that says when Alexander was on his deathbed, he was asked, who do you want your empire to go to following your death? And he replied like the crazy person he was, give it to the strong, which basically means let people fight for it and the strongest guy who can hang on to it, he's the one who should have it. Well, that didn't end up happening. Instead of a world war, there was a brief period of fighting, and when the dust settled, Alexander's four highest-ranking generals end up dividing his empire between the four of them. They are who the angel is talking about when he says, his kingdom shall be broken up and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Now, note the precision here. It even says that the kingdom won't be divided among his posterity. That means it won't be divided to anybody in his family, any sons or anybody else. Alexander would have no sons to pass the empire onto, which was very unusual for a ruler of his stature. Today we know that Alexander spent most of his life as a gay and bisexual man, and as a result, he had no sons who were alive at the time of his death. He had a half-brother, but his half-brother was mentally disabled and considered unfit to rule. So Alexander's kingdom could not go to anyone in his own family, exactly as the Lord prophesied. And then we also notice it says, the kingdoms, once it's been divided, will not be according to his dominion, which just means that none of the four empires that will come out of Alexander's empire will be anywhere near as powerful as his was. And that would be true as well. When Alexander the Great's empire was split up among his four generals, the two most powerful would end up being Ptolemy and Seleucus, those were their names. They would both establish empires that would go on to have significant dynasties in world history. When the Bible talks about things being to the north or south without giving any reference point, the default reference point geographically is always Jerusalem and Israel. From God's perspective, Jerusalem is the center of the world. Geographically, the Ptolemaic Empire was to the south of Jerusalem, down in Egypt, while the Seleucid Empire was to the east and to the north, in the region we know as Syria today. Even though there would be times in history when they wouldn't hold that northern territory, for most of this period of time, they would. And so when the Bible talks about anything being to the north, it's going to be talking about them. The bad news for Israel, if you can picture this in your mind, Egypt down here, Israel right here, above them Syria. The bad news for Israel is that they are right in the middle 
of these two enormous empires. And so every time one of these guys fights the other, as they go back and forth, back and forth, they literally trample through Israel. And it's not a great place to be living when soldiers who are pumped up on adrenaline with a bloodlust ready for war are coming through your country, or when soldiers who are angry from defeat or on a high from victory come back through your country. Those are not good things to have coming through your backyard on a regular basis. And this would be the state of affairs for 150 years between these two empires until Rome rises to power and Pompeii conquers the whole region. Interestingly, this all unfolds in what is often known as the silent year. Some of you may have heard that phrase. It's the term given to the time period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. There's a 400 year period there where God doesn't speak to Israel. So there's nothing to really be recorded during that time period. And in verses 5 through 35, the angel is going to detail to Daniel what is going to happen during those silent years. They are actually covered in the Bible here in Daniel 11. And it's all going to center around the problems Israel has from being the buffer state between these two epic empires. So as we read these coming verses about the king of the south and the king of the north, we know it's relative to Jerusalem and Israel. So write this down. These are going to be your only fill-ins today. The south will refer to the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt. The south will refer to the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt. On the other side of things, the north will refer to the Seleucid Empire in Syria. The north will refer to the Seleucid Empire in Syria. Now we jump in, and this is going to be epic, so hang on and let's try and hang together on this. Verse 5, also the king of the south, so the Ptolemy in Egypt, will become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. The original King James is actually a better translation, so this is how it should read. Let me read it to you. In the King James it says, and the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. The idea is not that this prince is going to have dominion over the king of the south. The idea is just that this prince is going to grow to have more power and a greater kingdom than the king of the south, not that he's going to rule over the king of the south. When Alexander's Greek empire is divided up, one of his princes, one of his generals, Seleucus, one of the four generals says, you know, I don't really want anything crazy. I I don't want to run like a huge giant empire. The city-state of Babylon is really all I need, just a quiet little getaway, and I'll be fine. So Lucas has an alliance with the new king of Egypt, one of the other generals, Ptolemy, their old military buddies, and their friendship keeps going. But Seleucus is really not a big deal on the world political stage. All he has is the city-state of Babylon. But he has a big problem. One of the other princes, one of Alexander's other four generals, Antogenes, has his sights set on conquering everything, and he is continually attacking Seleucus in Babylon. Things get so bad, Seleucus has no choice but to take his army and flee Babylon. He goes off to hang out with his buddy Ptolemy down in Egypt. Well, an incredible thing happens. While he's there in Egypt, Seleucus doesn't kick back. He begins studying. He begins learning military strategy. His troops begin training with Ptolemy's troops. And after nine years, Ptolemy backs Seleucus, and he goes back to Babylon and retakes it from Antogenes. Not only that, after taking back Babylon, Seleucus now keeps going. He's like, I'm on a roll, baby. And he conquers essentially the entire eastern part of Alexander's former empire. And when the dust has settled, he is actually more powerful than his buddy Ptolemy. And things have really changed. Verse 6, and at the end of some years, so a bunch of time passes, and the Seleucid Empire comes to be ruled by Antiochus II. The Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt becomes ruled by Ptolemy II. And so the original military buddies, the original generals are no longer there. 
So these two guys now begin fighting back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they're fighting over the territory of Israel and Syria. But we read, they shall join forces for the daughter of the king of the south, so Ptolemy II's daughter, shall go to the king of the north, that would be Antiochus II, to make an agreement. Around 252 BC, after what's known in history as the Second Syrian War, a tentative peace is brokered by the political act of Antiochus II marrying Ptolemy II's daughter, Bernice. Problem was, Antiochus II already had a wife. Her name was Laodice. But for the sake of regional peace, it was decided that the best thing to do for everybody was for Antiochus II to divorce Laodice and marry Bernice, thus brokering peace. So the wedding takes place and Laodice is divorced and put away. She still has a lot of power, a lot of influence, and she is a smart, smart lady. And she continues working behind the scenes, trying to get things into place so that she can return to a seat of power in the Seleucid Empire. So the wedding takes place. She's divorced and put away, but she's not going to let things stay that way. Then we keep reading, and it says, but she, Bernice, shall not retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand. But she, Bernice, shall be given up. She'll be killed with those who brought her, those who are traveling with her, and with him who begot her, her father, Ptolemy II, and with him who strengthened her in those times." That would be Antiochus II. So this is how specific the prophecy is. The angel is telling Daniel, here's the thing. When this happens, though, it's going to end with all of them dying. Bernice is going to die. Those traveling with her are going to die. Her father is going to die. And the guy who strengthened her in those times, Antiochus II, he's going to die too. Well, how does this go down? In 246 BC, six years after Bernice marries Antiochus II, Ptolemy II dies. And so Antiochus II says, you know, I really miss Laodice. And now that Ptolemy II is dead, we're not really accomplishing anything by this political marriage. So there's no point keeping this charade of a marriage going. So he goes back to Laodice and he says, babe, babe, I really want you back. Can, do you think you can get past that whole me divorcing you for political reasons things. It, it was six years ago. Let, let's move on. You know what though? Women are funny. She says, I can. She's lying. Shortly after that, almost immediately, she poisons him and has some of her minions who she has strategically positioned around the empire kill Bernice and the infant son that she bore with Antiochus II, as well as the entourage that's traveling with them. And exactly as the Lord said it would happen, they're all dead. She had a plan in place for all this, and now she, still technically queen of the Seleucid Empire, quickly pronounces her son from her previous marriage with Antiochus II, she, she pronounces their son Seleucus II, king. Verse 7, but from a branch of her roots, so from the family line of Bernice, one shall arise in his place. One shall arise in the place of Ptolemy II, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, which is now Seleucus II, and deal with them and prevail. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the son of Ptolemy II, the brother of Bernice, Ptolemy III, takes over the throne in the Ptolemaic Empire. And he is enraged to find out what Laodice has done to his sister Bernice and her child. So he gathers an army, marches north through Israel, seizes the Syrian port of Antioch, and sees the Seleucid Empire as far as Babylon, killing a whole bunch of them in the process, including Laodice. And one of the things Ptolemy III did while he was up there was steal around 2,500 gods, idols, to carry back with him to Egypt. 
And the reason he did that was because it was a grievous, grievous insult to steal a nation or an empire's gods, their statues. Because the inference was, listen, if we can load your gods into the backs of wagons and cart them back to our country, you really don't have gods that are very impressive. So it was like a giant insult. And then at the end of verse 8, it says, he shall continue more years than the king of the north. That's simply an allusion to the fact that Ptolemy III would outlive Seleucus II by almost four years. So now remember the context. The point is that all of this warfare is raging between these two powers. Israel, through all of this, is in the middle being trampled. Verse 9, also the king of the north, Seleucus II still, shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, Egypt, but shall return. He'll have to return back to his own land of Syria. Well, now the Seleucids are angry that the Ptolemies have killed Laodice, their queen. So two years later, Seleucus II reorganizes his army and marches south against Egypt. But he gets his butt kicked and has to go back home to Antioch with only a small percentage of his army still alive. Every time these guys are marching north or south, they're going through Israel. Can you imagine what a tense place it would have been to live at this time in history? Verse 10, however, his sons, so Seleucus II's sons, shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one, we'll find this will be Antiochus III, shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through, pass through Israel. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south, this will be Ptolemy IV now, shall be moved with rage and go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. If you're not picking this up, the flow is just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So Seleucus II's oldest son, Seleucus III, only lasts two years before being assassinated by his own troops. After that, in 223 BC, the next oldest son, Antiochus III takes the throne in the Seleucid Empire, and he decides he is going to take care of Egypt. So in 219 BC, Antiochus III takes 75,000 troops and captures a bunch of territory that had been controlled by Egypt, including Syria and Israel, but he doesn't go all the way down to Egypt. He waits sort of in Israel, he recharges his troops, he lets them rest, he builds some temporary fortresses, but in 217 BC, Ptolemy IV decides we're not waiting for them to get stronger. And he goes north and he meets them in battle just south of Gaza in Israel today. And they fight the Battle of Raphia. Ptolemy wins and takes control of Israel. But Ptolemy IV is not a fighter. He's a lover of wine, woman, and the good life. And war is literally the last thing he wants to do. So when Antiochus III's forces are forced to retreat north after losing the Battle of Raphia, Ptolemy IV just says, well, I guess that's that. Let's go back home, boys, and have a couple of drinks. He doesn't finish off the Seleucids or Antiochus III, which will come back to bite him later. On his way home to Egypt... Ptolemy IV makes a victory tour through all these cities in his new territory of Israel. And on one of them, he goes through Jerusalem. In 3rd Maccabees in the Apocrypha, it says that while he was in Jerusalem, he worships the God there at the temple a little bit, but then he decides, you know what? I'm going to go into the Holy of Holies. And they're like, you can't do that. This is a sacred space. That's where the presence of God is. You can't do it. And he says, I'm Ptolemy IV. I am a God. I can go wherever I want to go. So he lets them know, hey, on this day, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go in. The priests are all mourning on the ground. And in 3rd Maccabees, it says that when he tries to enter the Holy of Holies, he was struck with temporary paralysis by God and had to be dragged out of the temple by his own troops. Angered by this, he leaves Jerusalem. And the Apocrypha says he leaves issuing bitter threats and when he gets back to Egypt, he takes out his anger by persecuting the Jews who are living in Egypt at that time. Verse 12, when he, Ptolemy IV, has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he, his empire, will not prevail. Basic deal is Ptolemy IV is feeling like the man after winning the Battle of Raphia, but it's not going to last. Verse 13, 
For the king of the north, still Antiochus III, will return and muster a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. So Antiochus III goes back up. He says, we got to regroup. We need a bigger army. We need to be faster, stronger, smarter, more skilled. And he goes to work building this bigger, better army. Ptolemy IV dies in 204 BC and following his death, his five-year-old son, Ptolemy V, is made ruler and is obviously just completely controlled by his advisors and things like that. So Antiochus III looks down at this and he says, uh, listen, the Ptolemies are in disarray. Their king is a child. Their political scene is a joke. This is a great time to attack. So he forms some alliances with guys like Philip V of Macedon, and they decide, hey, we're going to go down together. We're going to conquer the Ptolemies, and we're going to divide up their territory among us. So in 198 BC, Antiochus III sets out with his now larger army. Verse 14, now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south, Egypt. Also, violent men, the literal translation is the children of the robbers, of your people, he's speaking to Daniel, so these would be Jews, shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall, they'll die. All that means is a lot of people were going to get on board with Antiochus III as him and his army get ready to go south and take on the Ptolemaic Empire. Among those people who would get on board with him would be apostate Jews from Israel who were thinking, this is a great chance to get in the good graces of Antiochus III so that maybe when he conquers this whole territory, he'll let us go free and rule ourselves, which was wishful, foolish thinking, but that's why they join him and they just end up dying. Verse 15, so the king of the north, Antiochus III, shall come and build a siege mound and take a fortified city. And the forces of the south, Egypt, shall not withstand him. But even his choice troops, Ptolemy V's choice troops, shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him, so when Antiochus III comes against Ptolemy, Antiochus III shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He, Antiochus III, shall stand in the glorious land, that would be Israel, with destruction in his power. So almost 20 years after his defeat in round one, almost 20 years after the Battle of Raphia, Antiochus III retakes Israel. And once again, Israel is trampled by being in the wrong place at the wrong time between these two warring empires. Verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him, thus shall he do. And he shall give him the daughter of woman to destroy it, but she shall not stand with him or be for him. While Antiochus III had defeated the Ptolemies in Syria and Judea, he hadn't actually conquered their empire. He hadn't conquered Egypt. So around 197 BC, Antiochus III sets out with a fleet of ships to attack Cilicia, which is just this modern coastal area of Turkey as well as the region of Caria. These are both areas under Egyptian control at that time. However, Antiochus III is disastrously defeated by a rising power on the world stage known as the Romans. This happened because the Egyptians had managed to ally themselves with the Romans, which would prove to be a really, really big problem for Antiochus III. So time for plan B, he's like, okay, comes up with a new plan. He's going to take his daughter, Cleopatra, not that Cleopatra, different Cleopatra, and he's going to plant her as a deep cover spy in the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt. This is going to be a long con, basically. So he gives her to Ptolemy V and says, as a gesture of peace, you can have my daughter, Cleopatra, as soon as Ptolemy V comes of age. So when he's 16, her dowry was Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea. So Antiochus III gets all of those territories as a dowry for his daughter. So Cleopatra moves down to Egypt, and after, after a couple of years, when Ptolemy V is 16 and she's 10, they are married. And the plan was that because Ptolemy V had been raised in such a messed up way, been king since he was five, eventually Cleopatra, as she gets older, should be able to use her feminine wiles to manipulate Ptolemy V. 
in such a way that Antiochus III will be able to come down and she would have pre-sabotaged things down there so that the Egyptians can be conquered. That's the plan. However, this all goes horribly wrong. This is like some ridiculous like soap opera here. It goes horribly wrong because she falls in love with him for real. For real. And she becomes the devoted wife and sides with Ptolemy V and their new ally, Rome. Suffice to say, Antiochus III had not anticipated that turn of events. He's like, you had one job. You had one job. And this whole plan leads to nothing. And so I know we're moving fast here, but I, I hope you're being impacted in some way by just how precise these prophecies are. This is unbelievable. Nothing happens in history that God is not aware of before it happens. And nothing happens in history that is beyond the borders and limits that God establishes. Verse 18, after this, he, Antiochus III, shall turn his face to the coastlands and take many. This is plan C. It's around 196 BC and a frustrated Antiochus III turns his focus toward the west, Greece and Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. He crosses the Hellespont into Thrace, which is Greek territory, and he begins conquering. Then we keep reading in verse 18, but a ruler, this will be Rome, shall bring the reproach against them to an end. And with the reproach removed, he, Rome, shall turn back on him. The problem was, at this time in history, that territory had actually been wrested from the control of the Greeks into the control of the Romans. So while trying to conquer the Greek islands, Antiochus III ends up coming up against the Romans and has to abandon that plan as well. Nothing is working out for him. However, Rome now deems Antiochus III a troublemaker. And as a result, a few years later in 191 BC, Antiochus III is defeated by the Romans at Thermopylae. And in 190 BC, the Romans come to finish the job and his army of 80,000, Antiochus' army of 80,000, suffers an ignominious defeat in a decisive battle near Smyrna where the Roman commander forces him to renounce all claims to all territories in Europe and Asia and pay a heavy tribute of 15,000 talents of gold. As a result, Antiochus III is ruined. Verse 19, then he, Antiochus III, shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. He'll die. So with nothing else to do and plenty of pent up frustration and needing to feel like he's not completely impotent as a military leader, Antiochus III returns to the northeastern part of his own kingdom and begins plundering the religious temples in his own territory. And while pillaging one of those temples, he's killed by one of his own people. All of Antiochus III's military ventures had taken a tremendous financial toll on the Seleucid Empire. They had a huge deficit, and it was being compounded by the fact that Rome said, hey, you know what, Seleucids? We've kicked your butt once before. You know we can do it again anytime you want. If you don't want that to happen, you're going to start paying taxes to us. The Romans began extorting the Seleucids, which leads us to verse 20. There shall arise in his place, in the place of Antiochus III, one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. Antiochus III is succeeded upon death by Seleucus IV, who after 12 years ends up deciding that the only real solution to their financial problems is just raising taxes on everyone to pay off the debts and keep the Romans happy. He does this for a short time, but the people don't like it. People didn't like taxes back then, un unlike today, where we're much more understanding. He announces, Seleucus IV does, hey, you know what? It's time to take this whole taxing thing up a notch. We can do better. It's a new fundraising campaign. So he says, I'm sending out a thousand tax collectors to make sure we don't miss anybody and we get every penny that we can. But before that can happen... One of his generals, Heliodorus, who hoped to steal the throne, slipped some poisonous mushrooms into his dinner, and Seleucus IV dies. However, Heliodorus is quickly outmaneuvered before he can take the throne, the throne by someone even more wily, and all of this will set the stage for the remainder of this chapter, for out of the tensions between the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires, 
emerges a person whose most infamous years lay down a prophetic pattern that will be followed in the future by the one known as Antichrist. The man we're talking about, the one who steals the throne from Seleucus IV before Heliodorus can step in, is the one known as Antiochus IV, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And we've gone into great detail about him in some of our earlier studies in the book of Daniel. Again, if you missed that, go back and listen. It's fascinating. Verse 21, we read, And in his place, so after Seleucus IV, shall arise a vile person, that would be Antiochus IV, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty, but he shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. The literal word there is flatteries. Antiochus had no legitimate claim to the throne. He maneuvered behind the scenes. He had people assassinated or thrown in prison. He did whatever he had to do to seize power. He told people what they wanted to hear and convinced them he was the best man for the job. He was so charismatic that he was able to convince people that he was the rightful king, not only of the Seleucid Empire, but also of Israel. And as soon as he was in power, the first thing he did was remove the legitimate high priest from the temple in Jerusalem and put in his place a false high priest that he had chosen. Verse 22, with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken. And also the prince of the covenant. That's just speaking about the fact that Antiochus IV would go on to crush the Ptolemies. The prince of the covenant, we're told, was a term for the high priest in Jerusalem. And so Bible scholars tell us that when it talks about the Prince of the Covenant being broken, which means just being killed basically, that's a reference to the high priest who was known as Onias III, who was murdered in 170 BC as a result of Antiochus III's political policies. Verse 23, and after the league is made with him, so after he comes to power and everyone agrees to that, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. Once Antiochus IV established his rule, he very quickly started consolidating power and acting deceitfully. Verse 24, he shall enter peacefully even into the richest places of the province and he shall do what his fathers have not done nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil and riches and he shall devise his plans against the strongholds but only for a time. Unlike his fathers, Antiochus IV robbed the richest places in his own kingdom. And he would come in saying nice things, and then when they least expected it, he would steal from them and redistribute the wealth among the people of his kingdom, which would keep him incredibly popular with people and secure his power. Whenever any area in his kingdom, any town, any city, any person would begin to gain influence and become powerful, he would cut them down and destroy them. So on one hand, he seemed like Robin Hood, and a lot of the common people really liked him. On the other hand, he was ruthless, oppressive, and built a power base by annihilating anyone who opposed him or anyone who may even pose a future threat to him. Verse 25, he, Antiochus IV, shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. This will be Ptolemy VI at this time, with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he, Ptolemy VI, shall not stand. For they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat of the portion of his delicacies, those who eat at his own table, shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away and many shall fall down slain. So Antiochus IV gets into a battle with the Ptolemy from the south in Egypt in 170 B.C. Ptolemy VI is only 16 years old when it happens, and his house, the political house of the Ptolemies, is still at this time a train wreck. He's got a brother who also wanted to be in charge. There's a divided political class. There's advisors manipulating them and giving them questionable advice. And as a result of all this, Antiochus IV ends up crushing the army of Ptolemy VI. However, because Antiochus IV has learned from the mistakes of Antiochus III. Antiochus IV says, I don't want to alarm Rome though. I don't want to get Rome's attention and have them start thinking that I might be a threat to them. So what he does is he allows Ptolemy VI to stay in Egypt as a vassal king, as a puppet head, as a figurehead, somebody with no power ruling on behalf 
of Antiochus IV. Verse 27, both of these kings' hearts, Ptolemy and Antiochus, shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table. But it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. So these guys were both evil, and even though they would both eat at the same table as alleged allies now, they couldn't trust each other. They'd make peace treaties and they would break them. History tells us, you know how many peace treaties have been broken in history? All of them. All of them. And it's still going on today. We see it even now, where in his last year in office, you saw Obama in the state saying, we've got a treaty with Iran, and we already know, inevitably, it's the most meaningless thing in the world. They have no intention of keeping the treaty, and they haven't. So that's all this is talking about. They'd get together, yes, let's make peace, but they were both lying the whole time, so it didn't really work out. But you know what? It says here, the appointed time was still the appointed time time. God was the one in charge of all of this and his will was still going to work out. Verse 28, while returning to his land, so as Antiochus IV goes back north after his victory over Egypt, it says he goes back with great riches. So one of the things he does is he just takes a bunch of treasure from Egypt back up north with him. It says, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant. That just means Israel and the Jews. So he shall do damage and return to his own land. On his way back north, Antiochus passes through Israel and Jerusalem. He raids the temple and he kills a whole bunch of Jews. We keep reading in verse 29. At the appointed time, he shall return. So he'll come back again from the north and go toward the south but it shall not be like the former or the latter. In 168 BC, Antiochus IV is feeling confident. He decides, you know what? Forget it. I don't want to leave anybody in charge in Egypt. I don't care about the Romans. I'm not going to leave a puppet king down there. I'm going to make sure everybody knows that Egypt is part of the Seleucid Empire. So he wants total domination. So he decides he's going to go down to Egypt for a second military campaign. And at the same time, he also sends a fleet of ships to try and conquer Cyprus. But it doesn't go as well as his first campaign against Egypt. In verse 30, it says, for ships from Cyprus shall come against him. We've talked about this story before. You see, unbeknownst to him, still at this time, Cyprus, which is part of Egyptian territory at this time, is being protected by the Romans, who are allies with Egypt. And so the Roman navy at this time as well is also docked in the Egyptian port of Alexandria. So he goes north, I'm going to take Cyprus. Oh man, the Romans are here. Go south to Egypt as well. Oh man, the Romans are here as well. And this is where we heard the story that I shared before, but it's worth sharing again. Before Antiochus IV can reach all the way to Alexandria, he and his army, as they're marching down the road, are stopped by a single elderly Roman ambassador who's only got a couple of soldiers with him. And he's standing in the middle of the road. And he's there to deliver to Antiochus a message from the Roman Senate. And the message is, get your butt out of Cyprus and out of Egypt, or consider yourself at war with the Roman Empire. Antiochus says, okay, let, let me go talk about it with my generals, and then I'll come back and give you an answer. And famously, the Roman general takes a stick and walks around Antiochus and draws a circle, and he says, Antiochus, I will have your answer before you step out of this circle. Antiochus says, can I phone a friend? Roman ambassador says no. After weighing his options, Antiochus realizes he has no option but to agree to retreat, which leaves him angry, embarrassed, humiliated, just in a really, really bad way, but with his army still with him. And in order to get back home up north, where does he have to go through? Israel, again. So we read this, therefore, so because of his failure at the hands of the Romans, he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenant and do damage. As he journeys back north towards Syria, Antiochus IV goes through Israel and unleashes hell on the Jews, which we've talked about at length in our earlier studies in the book of Daniel. 
when he first arrives in Jerusalem, his first act is to kill 40,000 Jews when he gets there. By the time his rage has been satiated, he's killed 100,000 of them. Then it says, so he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Then he begins demanding that all worship of the Jewish God, Yahweh, cease, along with all religious rituals, ceremonial cleanliness, circumcision, anything to do with the Jewish faith. If you were caught reading the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, you'd be killed. But if you did forsake the Lord, then Antiochus IV would show you regard. That means you wouldn't have any problems. If you refused, he would make your life hell. Verse 31, and forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Antiochus IV puts an end to Jewish worship and sacrifices at the temple. And then comes this event known as the abomination of desolation. When he goes into the Holy of Holies in the temple, sacrifices a pig, which was an unclean animal to the Jews, on the altar in the Holy of Holies, smears the blood on the wall, and demands that the Jewish temple priests drink the remainder of the pig's blood. And then he sets up an idol of himself in the Holy of Holies and demands that the people worship it and him as God. And so Antiochus IV goes down in history along with men like Caesar, Nero, and Hitler as one of the most insane, demonically inspired rulers of all time. Verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant, against the Jews in Israel, he, Antiochus IV, shall corrupt with flattery but, and then I love this phrase, I have it underlined in my Bible, the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The abomination of desolation ends up making some people terrified and they turn their back on God and their faith. But for others, that event becomes a catalyst for a Jewish guerrilla rebellion led by the family of the Maccabees. This is known as the Maccabean Revolt. God supernaturally empowers them, and in just a few years, by 165 BC, they emerge victorious against the Seleucid Empire in Israel, and they kick them out. They celebrate the consummation of that victory by remembering the day they cleansed and rededicated the temple. It was the 25th of Kislev on the Hebrew calendar, December 25th on our calendar. Verse 33, and those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Yet for many days they shall fall by sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many shall join with them by intrigue. The angel is basically saying, Daniel, if you think the 70 years in Babylon is the end, you've missed it. There will be 70 years, and then at the end of those 70 years, there's going to be a Xerxes who's going to dominate your land. Then there will be an Alexander the Great who will dominate your land. Then there will be an Antiochus III who will overrun your land. Then there will be an Antiochus IV. There will, however, be some moments of help and relief, things like the Maccabean Revolt. Verse 35, and some of those understanding shall fall. That means they'll die. So, so why are you doing all this, Lord? Why, why are you doing all this to your people, the Jews? And here's the answer. I have this underlined in my Bible. To refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. The purpose of all this is to drive the Jews back to the Lord. When you're faced with death and suffering, your thoughts begin to move to what happens after death. You begin to evaluate your life, your beliefs, your priorities. And through all of this suffering, there was always a small group of Jews who did stay faithful to the Lord. The Bible calls them the remnant. The Bible also tells us that remnant has continued even through the last 2,000 years. There have always been people who were ethnically Jewish who turned to the Lord. Even after Jesus came, most of the early church in Jerusalem was made up of people who were ethnically Jewish. They were part of the remnant and there's still a remnant alive today. The tragedy of all this is that the Jews at the end of all these centuries would not receive Jesus as their Messiah. As a nation, they would reject him. 
And so the season of the Lord's discipline would continue. The 70 year of Babylonian exile didn't break the nation of Israel. The 400 years of being trampled by empires didn't break the nation of Israel. The arrival of Messiah, Jesus, didn't break the nation of Israel. And so now the Jews sit in what the Bible says is a season of God-ordained spiritual blindness still under the Lord's discipline until the time arrives that God says will break them and will cause them to turn back to them. That time will be the great tribulation. Wouldn't you agree, and we're going to wrap up in just a second here, wouldn't you agree that God has every right to forget about Israel, to say, I'm done, I am done. I mean, they're stubborn, and then there's 2,500 years stubborn. That's stubborn. It'd be so easy for God to say, I'm done, but, but he doesn't. In fact, in Romans 11, Paul reminds us that God's plan is that, quote, all Israel will be saved, will be saved. When you or I are self-righteous and, and puffed up and we're thinking too much of ourselves and we're thinking, you know, I'm doing pretty good as a follower of Jesus. When we're in that place, we look at Israel and we say, why don't you turn your back on them? Why aren't you done? I mean, they just don't get it. But when you come to realize how holy God is and how sinful we are. How many times we drop the ball? How many times we forsake the Lord? You look at Israel and you think, thank God he doesn't turn his back on them. Thank God, because maybe there's a chance for me too. And you know what? God will never turn his back on you either. He's never going to forsake Israel and he'll never forsake you. As the psalmist wrote in Psalm 139, many of you know this, he says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. He's never going to turn his back on you, not for a second. And his love for you is not based on anything you've done. This is the great part. God's love for you is based on what Jesus has done for you. Praise God for that. And if there is a practical application, I was thinking about it, I wanted to share that it's probably this. If the Lord is disciplining you right now in an area of your life, if he's calling you to repent, to change, to turn back toward him, even in one specific area of life, my prayer is that this study fills you with a holy, righteous fear of the Lord and if nothing else, it reminds you that God is not going to let it go. He is going to keep his hand of discipline upon you until you repent, until you change. You know, as a parent, we always say, as soon as my kid gets into a battle of wills with me, I can't lose. I'm the parent. I cannot lose that battle of wills. So if we're going to have a standoff, I'm not going to lose because I'm the parent. Israel is being stubborn. God will not give up. He says, you've got to turn to Jesus. You've got to turn to Jesus. You've got to turn to Jesus. 2,500 years go by. God is still not saying, you know what? Let's put this issue to the side and we'll deal with something else for now. If there's an area of your life that God is speaking to you in, he's not going to let it go until you deal with it. You're going to come to church, you're going to be like, oh, I want to worship. Lord, do you have anything to say to me? God's going to be like, you know exactly what I have to say to you. It's the same thing I said to you last week when you asked me that question. And the week before that, and the week before that, and the week before that. 
He's not going to let it go. And the reason is because he loves you and he wants what is best for you. He wants what is best for you. If any of my kids were doing something that was incredibly destructive, one way or another, I would not let that go. I would be praying for them. I would be talking to them about it. And if they wouldn't listen to me, I would pray even harder. But the one thing I'm not going to do is let it go because I love my kids. And God loves us. And so if you're in rebellion in an area of your life, don't think that you're going to outlast God because he's not going to let it go. He loves you too much. He loves you too much. With that, let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And thank you so much for your incredible love for us. Thank you that because you are a God who can see the future, And who knows and controls the future, Lord. You are able to look into our lives and speak with absolute authority when you tell us that is not the path you should be following. Father, give us the wisdom to understand that that is not simply your preference, but that you have already seen the future. And you are telling us that the thing that will lead to peace and joy and fulfillment and life is doing things your way. And you have literally come back in time to urge us to choose the path that will lead to life. So Father, if there is any area of our lives where we are headed towards something that is less than your best for us, would you shine a light on that area? Would you reveal it to us right now in the name of Jesus? And help us to respond to you as the God that you are. Not as a friend offering a suggestion, but as the almighty God who holds time in his hands. Lord, may we be filled with gratitude that you would love us enough to instruct us in the path of life, Lord. And Father, thank you for your faithfulness to your people Israel. Thank you that we can look at your faithfulness to them and in it see your character and understand that you are and will be just as faithful to us. Everything that you've started in us, you will be faithful to complete. Every promise you've made to us, you are able to keep. God, we marvel at your ability to keep us in your grace, to keep us in your hand. And we thank you that your grace is stronger and is greater than our ability to sin. Your grace is greater, God. Thank you for loving us, Jesus.